Well, good afternoon, YouTubers. This is Steve Bradley come to, coming to you once again from the God Loves People YouTube channel. And today I'm going to talk about the worst way to die. Um, I've done this in PowerPoint so that you can spend some time taking notes if you wish. And I hope you enjoy it, but it's not really there for enjoyment. It's there to help you understand life and yourself. This is about the worst way to die, and this contains some more thoughts on death and dying. So here we go. Now, of course, these are not pleasant topics. Nobody wants to think about death, and nobody really wants to think about dying. However, we have to think about them and discuss them, because we will die. The earliest prophecy in the Bible is not about Jesus Christ, as some will tell you, and John er, in um, Genesis 3:15, but it is about death. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 say, "The Lord commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Now this expression, you will surely die, embraces not only the fact of death, but all of its processes, how it starts, disease, suffering, all that. The Hebrew is literally, dying you shall die. In other words, death begins early. It begins when we're born, as, thing, as we have a terminal point, just as we have a beginning point. And the process continues until life actually ends on this earth. We will die. All of us will die. However, some will die forever. There will be nothing for them but death. While others will quote-unquote die only to live again in the presence of God. Now the worst way to die is to not care about the possibility of everlasting life not to understand that it can be yours, and to be so locked into this life so that you never desire to see beyond the life you have now. I want to talk to you about the moron. In the Bible, there is one man who is called a fool to his face, or if you prefer, the word moron, which really grasps a little more closely the idea that's tr that uh, God is communicating to us in the scriptures. So it says, Then he, Jesus, said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. In other words, your life is more than what you own. And he, he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself and said, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said to himself, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns, and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. So he's going to spend the rest of his life enjoying life. However, God said to him, you fool, or maybe better, you moron, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you've prepared? Excellent question, because as the old joke says, at the funeral, one was asking another, he said, well, what did he, leave? what did he leave behind? And the first person says, well, he left it all. You'll never have a chance after you die to have the stuff you had today. And so Jesus responds to this whole parable by saying, so is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. 
So if all you're looking forward to is retirement, you got a big problem. Now this is the one place in the Bible that God calls a man a fool directly to his face. He was a fool because he didn't know or care about eternity. Life go on, would go on, he thought, and he would live. Only life went on for other people, and he died that very night. That man was a spiritual moron, and so are you if you think only about your life in the here and now. There's a lot more about this type of person in the Bible in Psalms 14, 53, 49, 73, Luke 16, 19 to 31, to name just a few. And the book of Revelation is full of this. So think about life and think about forever, because it's much longer than right now. So why does God say this to men and women who think and live without considering what happens after they die? What is, why does it matter? Well, here is why. Eternity is forever. It's much longer than the 70, 80, 100 years God gives you on this earth. And what you do with your life now decides what happens to you in eternity. And this is a very important thought because the next event after you die is judgment. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. You will not avoid this judgment. You will face the judge. And you know, he really doesn't care how much money you've got, who you are, what you can do, what your strengths and weaknesses are. He doesn't care about any of that because once you die, all that's gone. What God cares about is whether you are rich toward him and that's it, nothing more. You cannot escape this judgment. You cannot bribe the judge. You are not important to him because you are rich, famous, or powerful. And you will be judged on the basis of two things. Number one is your works. And number two is whether or not you are rich toward God. And the latter is the real issue. Let me explain. Now the Bible discusses how God will judge you and me. And it's very clear. So first thing will be is that this judgment will be according to works. It will include every single thing we did. Nothing will be left out. God knows everything. He's omniscient. That's what the word knows everything means or vice versa. He knows all the stuff you did. He's got it in his head and he's not going to forget it. This judgment will be in righteousness. In other words, he is going to judge the world by the standard of righteousness that he has demanded of, men, of mankind. There won't be any bribery. There won't be any favoritism. You can't go to God and say, well, I'm powerful, because before him, you're basically nothing. Now, this judgment will be through the man whom God has appointed. That's Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 17, verse 31 discusses this, as John chapter 5, 22 does. This judgment will include every one of your secrets. That's the part that scares me the most. And so I try to have no secrets from God. And I'm trying very hard not to have secrets from man. This judgment will include your attitudes. What do you really want out of life? You have a righteous, infinite, eternal, all-knowing, all-powerful being deciding your fate who cannot be bribed, who cannot be persuaded, whose mind cannot be changed. But we'll talk a little bit more about that later. This judgment will be so just that you agree with it. But even if you did not, there is no escape, no appeal, no change possible. And only one lawyer will be present, and he alone, for those who have believed in him, 
and that's Jesus Christ. The Bible says we have an advocate, a lawyer, who is next to the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now this is the real Supreme Court. We kind of accede to the Supreme Court in these days, thinking that it's so important, it's nothing compared to this. So what if I told you that you could meet that day with no worries, with confidence? Well, you can, and here's how. The judgment is coming, and there's no escape. However, you can do thing, do two things, I should say, to make it a time of blessing and not a time of infinite sorrow and anger. The first one is in the Bible. It says, repent. It says, God commands all men everywhere to repent, seeing that he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, and that man is Jesus Christ. Number two is to believe in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 10, verses 10 through 13, tell us that it is necessary for us to believe in the Lord. Repent comes from a word in Greek, which means to change your mind. And used in the Bible, it means to turn from evil and toward God. In other words, to do a 180. In virtually all contexts, it precedes faith. In other words, you repent first and then you believe. But usually what happens in a practical sense is that they just go together. You're sorry for your sin and you believe in Jesus Christ. That's how it works. So in Acts chapter 17, verses 30 to 31, we read, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day. In other words, he's already figured out when this is going to happen, in which he will judge the world in righteousness through the man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. That man is Jesus Christ who is both God and man, or as the New Testament puts it in the King James and New King James, God manifest in the flesh. The second thing you have to do is believe. Now you can be sorry for the bad stuff you did. You can turn away from them. You can become a quote unquote good person but that is not enough. It is only enough when you also put your faith in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 say this, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. In other words, you say, I'm going to make Jesus my Lord. I want to follow him. You confess that with your mouth and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. For with the heart, Someone believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And then in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, it says, Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You believe, and you ask, and you've got it. That's it. Now, this is so simple that many people miss it. And they often miss it because they want to provide their own way to survive that judgment. In other words, they want to do all kinds of good works to make amends for all the bad stuff they did. That's not a bad thing to do, but it's not enough. Because there really is only one way, the way of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. That, and that alone, makes you rich toward God. Jesus said it like this. He goes, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then a lot of people miss the last part of it because that says nobody comes to the Father except through me. Nobody gains the Father's approval except through Jesus Christ. Nobody gets eternal life except through Jesus Christ. Nobody has his sins forgiven except through Jesus Christ. Nobody is born again except through Jesus Christ. Nobody becomes the object of God's fatherly love 
except through Jesus Christ. We read God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But then we read in John chapter 3, verse 36, says, whoever believes in the Son has everlasting life, but he who does not believe in the Son does not have life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's a terrible thought. God's anger on you. Why? Because you rejected his Son. Now, you know, there are always consequences for what we do and how we think. I've experienced some of those, and I'm sure you have as well. It's terrible to realize that all your sins, sinful thoughts, attitudes, emotions, and all the rest are going to be assessed by the judge of all the earth. He's going to take the book, and he's going to look at it, and he's going to say, hmm, right here you told a lie. And you're going to say, well, well I, I have a reason I told that lie. And he's going to say, it doesn't matter. You told a lie. And God will judge your fate and decide it. He is God and you're not. See, that's the mistake that we make in this age. We think that we are sovereign. We are not. God is the sovereign. He is the ruler. We are not captains of our own soul. He is the one who will decide our eternal fate. Now, on the other hand, there's tremendous comfort in this verse. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the Apostle Paul writes, For the wages of sin is death. In other words, that's what it's going to pay you. You're going to be paid that wage. Death forever. Death spiritually. Death But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the thing is, you can get that today. You can get it now. You don't have to wait for it. You can get it today. In John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus said, He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has, that's a current present tense, has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. You're going to avoid that terrible, terrible assessment of your life. Jesus Christ is your way of salvation, and he is the only way. Now, God offers this gift freely prior to Judgment Day. Now, let me say, it, say that that way again. God offers this gift freely prior to Judgment Day, that is, before you die. Anyone can get it, as long as you're still alive. However, when you die, the offer is withdrawn. There's no more opportunity. There are no second chances. There's, there are no do-overs. Judgment is the next thing. And so my counsel to you is turn to him now. And the question is, what will you do? Because today is the day of salvation. What if there's no tomorrow for you? What if, like that guy who stored up all the good stuff and had his retirement all ready and was just rubbing his hands together and saying, boy, oh boy, I'm gonna have fun now. What if God says to you tonight, your soul will be required of you. What if he says that? Then where will you be? So turn to the Lord. Turn to him today. Turn to him now. You know, some of the most chilling words in the Bible are, Tonight thy soul is required of thee. And then, so is everyone. That would include you and me. And everyone, either one of us knows, everyone who is not rich toward God. Please don't be caught in that trap. Please don't put yourself out as if you are the sovereign of your own life and you'll just live forever on this earth. Be aware 
of eternity and prepare for it. Do that now. Please, I beg of you, do it today. Don't put it off even a minute because there are spiritual forces that do not want you to believe. Turn to him now.